everyone. Welcome back to the third section for the REST conference 2021. So uh, I'm Forrester from USC, and like Matt, um, I'm an assistant professor here. So I'll be moderating this session with the help of our PhD student, Fang Fei Su. Um, so Mary Margaret will be talking to us about the Walk the Talk ESG mutual fund voting on shareholders proposal. Um, and Danielle from University of Miami will be discussing this. So um, Mary Margaret, um, I hand over the Zoom section to you. Okay. Thank you. Let's make sure we can all see this. Can I get some thumbs up if we can see it? Okay, terrific. Well, uh, first of all, I've been sitting at the conference and just it's been great to see old friends on the Brady Bunch tiles. So hi to everyone out there. <laughs> Um, wish we could be in person to say hello, but I wanted to thank the conference organizers for the opportunity to get some really thoughtful and constructive feedback from two anonymous referees and an editor. There is just no greater joy than getting constructive feedback on a paper. And I also want to thank Daniele for the time that he has spent on the discussion. I really look forward to hearing his comments as well as getting you all's thoughts uh, through the chat. So this is a paper, we're not gonna walk the walk like the first paper, we're gonna walk the talk. And what you see, can see is we're gonna actually look at US, uh, excuse me, at US ESG mutual funds, but their voting behavior on shareholder proposals, as opposed to the last paper where they were looking at what firms do they invest in. This paper is joint with two colleagues at Darden, Shane DeColey and Luann Lynch as well as Michael Guo, who is a PhD student at Boston University, who used to be our MBA student. So it's just a great joy to be able to work with Michael on this paper. So let's get to it. Well, let's get to it. Let's move. There we go. Okay. So I, I, I could start by just saying, ditto Anish and Shiva right? Because a lot of what you're going to hear right now is very similar uh, to the motivations behind why we engaged in our uh, project as well. But let me just give you a little bit of background because it's great to see so many people interested in this topic. When I started teaching this topic uh, six or seven years ago, I felt like I was on an island by myself a lot. So it's great to see we have 435 people here interested in the topic. And if you haven't heard of ESG in 2021, you're kind of living under a rock. So ESG has been going, investing has been going on since the 1900s, but this wave that we're seeing at the turn of the century is really a product, I believe, of the UN acting as a catalyst to bring corporations, financial institutions together to achieve societal goals. And where you can really see that come into fruition is in 2005, where the UN got together with financial institutions and actually coined the term ESG. So ESG dates back to 2005. And not long after that, they launched the, the Principles of Responsible Investment, which we call PRI, which you've already heard about. So as we move through, you've already seen some of this from Gaska's presentation, oh, sorry, from Gaska's presentation, which it's growing. Okay, so since 2005, you can see that assets under management, sustainable investing has grown in the US. And the one fact that I'll point out is that now the US comprises 48% of global sustainable assets under management. So as was said in the earlier presentation, we're looking at an important and growing investment strategy out there in the marketplace. So, just like Anish, see Anish knew himself that mutual funds were interesting because of retail investors. I unfortunately had to go to my students because I am not a millennial, okay? So where this came about was I was teaching my sustainable investing class and I sent my students out to investigate ESG mutual funds with, because they wanted to invest with their own money. And I realized that they weren't going to be able to invest in the private equity and the venture capital funds that we were really looking at, that they were gonna be retail investors and investing through mutual funds. And so I sent them out to look at what their options were and they came back pretty disillusioned from that project. 
And so that left us, their professors, questioning sort of what retail investors might be buying when they invest in ESG mutual funds. So we decided that we would invest the, we would invest mutual funds and we wanted to provide data through our research to regulators in this space because we kind of had a feeling it was going to be of growing interest to regulators given the interest of the retail investor. So that's why we're focused on mutual funds. So now if we go to ESG, US ESG mutual funds, you can see that the assets under management follows the same trajectory as the slide, which was more broadly sustainable investing. And there's been, in this relatively new area of research, there's actually been, there's been some research published, but there is a growing literature uh, within working papers. So I'm just gonna highlight a few and I am by no means highlighting them all. But first, the prior literature suggests, and you heard this earlier, that ESG factors do, do affect investor choice of intermediaries, in our case, specifically mutual funds. And that's really important. Okay. So second, research investigates the different mechanisms that intermediaries use to fulfill investor preferences. And the paper you just saw, as well as some other papers, look at portfolio holdings or portfolio selection. We are gonna look at the other mechanism, which is engagement with portfolio firms. And there are many different ways to engage. And we're specifically gonna look at their engagement through voting on shareholder proposals. And then finally, there is a prior literature that suggests that corporations do respond to intermediaries as well as shareholder proposals. So just a little summary of some of the work that's out there, but by no means capturing a lot of the working papers that are currently out there. So if you turn to, if you turn to mutual fund managers, as you heard earlier, they are speaking out. Okay? So these are quotes from executives of the leading mutual fund companies, and they're speaking out more and more about their professed expectations of company sustainability practices and their willingness to vote to champion those sustainability efforts. Well, when you talk, people listen and they start to question. And so, as you saw also in the prior presentation that the European Union moved first and it has recently required and implemented its requirement of disclosure of engagement policies, including voting policies. But because we're focused in the US, and I agree, I actually think the US and the European Union, I think it's gonna be very, you've gotta really think about the region you're looking at. We're primarily motivated by the, e, by the US and therefore the SEC. They've listed ESG investing as a priority for, the 20, for 2020 and 2021. And specifically in 2021, they decided to review, as was mentioned, the policies and procedures of proxy voting. Do those align with the ESB, sorry, ESG strategies that they profess? And so what we want to do is provide some large scale evidence on do mutual fund managers walk the talk through their voting? So what do we predict? Well, so first, Given that we know ESG factors attract investment to mutual funds, we know that from prior research, and given that mutual funds state that ESG objectives, that their ESG objectives in their prospectus filed with the, ES, with the SEC, which we know to be true, okay, then if there's, assuming there's failure to follow through on these investment objectives, and that creates cost, okay, that, that the failure will create cost, such as regulatory and reputational cost, then our talk is going to be the fact that you stated that you were, that you had ESG investment objectives. And do you walk the talk? Our, uh, sorry, yeah, do you walk the talk? Our walk is do you vote for ES proposals? So our hypothesis is going to be do ESG funds, are they more likely than non-ESG funds to vote for ES proposals. Now, 
again, like the prior paper, we focus on ES proposals because we expect to find the results in these proposals more so than in governance proposals, because when you're looking at ESG funds versus non-ESG funds, there are arguments for why non-ESG funds would also be interested in governance proposals. But you might ask sort of why wouldn't we expect results? Well, one of the reasons we might not respect, expect results is that there's a high cost of voting for ES proposals. And one of those reasons could be that the proposal is value decreasing for the firm and thus the mutual fund portfolio. Now, one argument against that is that shareholder proposals aren't binding and therefore that might reduce the cost of voting for. Okay? But another reason okay, that you might not expect results is that they have other mechanisms to walk the talk as we saw in the prior paper that if they don't like the walk, they can just sell the fund, they can sell the firm, sell the shares in their portfolio. And so we're gonna test a second hypothesis that goes and looks at index funds because they are constrained in their ability to walk the talk through trading. And so our second hypothesis is gonna look at that higher likelihood of ESG funds voting for ES proposals relative to non-ESG funds. And is that difference more pronounced for index funds who have constraints on trading than active funds? Okay. So uh, data is always a bear, okay? And so you can read the paper to see the links we went to to get this data, okay? But as you can see, the, with the data, we took three different ISS databases. We merged them together. Okay. We, we got, let me find, let me let's see. Here we go. We ended up, when we merged the three databases, we got 3,777 proposals. But then we had to take that data and merge it with Morningstar because Morningstar had our definition of ESG fund. And in particular, because Morningstar reads the prospectuses and the offering documents looking for whether funds say their investment objectives are sustainability related. So, and that was a particular, our particular variable of interest. So when we combine that with when we combine the proposal data with the Morningstar data, we end up with 3,748 proposals, separate proposals. So I won't go in, because of time, I won't go into all our descriptive statistics, but I'd like to point out one, okay, because prior literature has made a big point of the effect of ISS recommendations on fund voting. Okay? And given our paper, breaks out governance and ES proposals, there is a paper from 2011, Morgan et al., that, that looks at these proposals in 2003 to 2005. We can do some comparisons. And what you can see is that there was a dramatic change in ISS recommendations for shareholder proposals. And what's even more interesting is that change is not driven by governance proposals that change is actually driven by their interest, uh, by voting more for, I, um, for ES shareholder proposals. And maybe not surprisingly, we see a similar pattern when we look at fund voting. So here's our empirical design. I think it's pretty straightforward. We use a pooled cross-sectional regression using a linear, me, a linear probability model. We run it with a probit specification and we get similar results. Okay. You can see our main variable of interest is going to be this ESG fund. And that is equal to one if Morningstar designates the fund as a sustainable investment overall. And then we control for other determinants that the prior literature has showed that matter for voting on pr proposals. And in particular, we want to point out the fund, the fixed effects for firm year. They control for time varying portfolio firm characteristics, 
But what I think is really interesting about this is what it means is we're capturing differences in ESG and non-ESG fund voting on ES proposals in the same annual meeting. So we feel like that is a really tight research design. Okay. So getting to our results. Okay. Well, let me not spoil, let wait any longer. We find support. Actually, to my surprise, I have to be honest, when I began this, I was actually thinking we might be working on a project and no results paper. And so to my surprise, we do find that ESG funds okay, are more likely than non-ESG funds to vote on ES proposals in support of hypothesis one. We also find that while government, this, we find that ESG funds are more likely to vote for non-ESG funds for governance proposals, the effect is much larger for ES proposals. And then finally, when we go and control for fund family, we continue to find support within the fund family. We had a comment from a referee that we really appreciated that said, hey, you know, what about alternative de definitions? And so what we did is we went and looked at the titles of the ESG funds. You can see a list of the words we used in the paper. I won't go through that. But what that did is that when we reclassified ESG funds based on their titles, we were left with 81 funds and we get similar results. And interestingly, the result is more pronounced with this designation versus when we use the investment objectives that Morningstar uses. Okay. When we turn to our second hypothesis, where we look at index versus active funds, what you're gonna find here is that it, when we go to look at index and, and, sorry, and active funds, ESG funds are more likely than non-ESG funds to vote in favor of ES proposals for both index and active funds. And here's where hypothesis two comes into play. That difference in the effect is more pronounced for index funds than active funds. And what we find is that difference is driven by the ESG funds, not by the non-ESG funds. And for comparative purposes, what we see is the same pattern of results, but the difference is not significantly different. The difference between index and active funds is not significantly different. Okay, so we've talked about the fund, but you know, as you heard earlier, the fund family also talks. Okay? So here are examples of two large fund families. And so, we thought we would look at and try and understand one way that the fund families amplify their voice. And that would be through being signatories of the PRI. So we began to ask ourselves, how is it that ESG funds vote when their fund family is a signatory of the PRI? And what we found is when you look within PRI fund families, yes, ESG funds are more likely to vote for ES proposals than non-ESG funds. And when you go to non-PRI families, you find that ESG funds are not more likely than non-ESG funds to vote for ES proposals. Hmm. But that's actually driven by the non-ESG funds. So this result in the PRI families is driven by the fact that non-ESG funds are less likely to vote for ES proposals than non-PRI families. It is not being driven by their ESG funds, which leaves leaves questions about the interplay between PRI, well, family funds in general and their funds. When we go to look at governance, we find very similar results, okay, both in the pattern and in the significance. 
So what do we conclude? Well, to be brief, do ESG funds walk the talk? Yeah, on average, they seem to. And it seems to be more pronounced in index funds than active funds, which we attribute to trading constraints. And do fund families matter? They absolutely do. We can see that both in when we control for fund family fixed effects, it reduces the likelihood by almost half, so suggesting the fund family has a large effect in this. But also more interestingly, what we find is that the PRI families walk the talk among themselves, which leaves the question, what's the right benchmark? What does it mean to walk the talk? And I just thank you so much and look forward to hearing Danielle's comments. Hey, Danielle, it's all yours. Okay. Uh, let me share the screen. All right, can you see it? All right, good. Well, uh, let me start by thanking the organizer of the conference and of course the editors of a trust for giving me the great opportunity to discuss this paper, which I enjoyed a lot. Um, so uh, I, this is the roadmap of what I want to do today. I'm going to do a, a very brief overview because Mary did a great job uh, summarizing the results. And I'm going to try to provide my motivation of the paper. Um, then what I want to do, I want to focus mostly on the other two points. I want to put the results of the paper into the framework of theory and prior findings in order to provide my interpretation of the results uh, consistent with the economic incentives of play. And then finally, I wanna uh, see, I mean, at least discuss how the analysis can be broadened in order to provide a broader picture. Um, so very briefly, the research question is, can you see it? No, it's not changing. Oops, all right. The research question is very straightforward. Uh, do ESG funds walk the talk? Uh, they examine voting, uh, and the two major findings of the paper related to the two hypotheses are that ESG funds are more likely to support ESG proposals, and that ESG index funds, as compared to ESG active funds, uh, are even more likely to, uh, to support these proposals. Um, so why is this is important? I think you know, we have seen in the past, uh, from the past two presenters that ESG is growing. Uh, everybody's aware of this phenomenon. We have research showing that investors care about ESG. Investors put a lot of money into funds that self-declare, I mean, that define themselves as, you know, green funds, funds that care about uh, the environment, that they care about social issues, they want to make an impact. And you can see from this graph that not only these funds are growing in terms of numbers, but also growing in terms of size. Now, uh, for some reason, if I use my keyboard, it's not working properly. Uh, so let, uh, I'm gonna stop that. So there is a big uh, debate, not only in academia, but also uh, among practitioners uh, about the actual role of these index funds. What you can see on the left picture is Larry Fink. I think everybody knows who Larry Fink is. And you know, many mutual fund managers, as well as uh, many firm managers have committed to make a social impact. On the right hand side, you see Tariq Fancy. Who's Tariq Fancy? Well, Tariq Fancy is one of the pioneers of the ESG uh, industry, ESG fund industry. He was the chief sustainability officer of BlackRock. So he was one of the first ones starting this industry. And now he left the industry and is one of the biggest opponents of the industry, saying that these funds are just marketing. They collect money from, from investors. And, and all they do is select firms uh, that are supposed to be greener, but they don't really make an impact. On top of that, and probably consistent with this debate, is the SEC that, as Mary explained in her presentation, is concerned about how these funds vote and how these funds are going to try to make an impact. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to focus on, I think that the, the paper um, findings speak to two streams of literature, which are the role of ESG funds and mutual fund voting. So with respect to with respect to the, vote, the, um, the role of ESG funds, uh, it's theoretically debated how uh, ESG funds can make an impact. There are two main governance mechanisms, which we all know, which are vo voice through voting or engagement and the threat of exit. And, and there are a number of interesting theory papers, both published or, or working papers that basically speak to these two channels. Uh, a recent paper by um, uh, Friedman and Heinle basically shows that, you know, these funds have all of these options available, but then eventually they will benefit more from preference alignment between firm managers uh, and, and, and fund managers because that will reduce 
costly influence efforts because, of course, engagement is, is, is pretty costly. There is another paper on JFE by Pastor and Coders that basically shows that uh, portfolio selection can have real effects even absent any intervention of fund managers. The story is that if funds invest in firms, market valuation of these funds will go up. And so that in and of itself will create incentives for managers, firm managers, to change firm behavior in order to attract these flows. It's going to also be an effect on cost of capital. Uh, of course, that view uh, is, doesn't go without opposition. There is another theory paper that basically argued that um, you know, the majority of managers, firm managers, are compensated on long-term firm value. And therefore, it's very unlikely that holding decision per se will be uh, strong enough to make managers change their ESG policies. Now, empirically, we're doing a little better, but not too much better. Um, there is generally evidence, at least this is my view of the literature, that these funds select good firms. I have a paper on these that look at micro-level data and show that uh, firms in the portfolio of these ESG funds select are firms with better pollution, so they pollute less, they invest more in pollution abatement technology, they have better employee satisfaction and better workplace safety, and they have higher gender diversity. The Anish paper and, and Shiva paper before show some evidence that these firms have higher scores but on the same time, they have more labor violations. So it's a little bit unclear. On the real effect side, my paper has some exogenous variation on, uh, on, uh, on, SR, on ESG funds ownership and it shows that actually these funds, even if they select good firms, they don't make these firms better. So now here, I think where this paper uh, is important, the, the Mary paper is important because rather than looking at two or three steps down the causal chain, i.e. real effects and stuff like that, they look at the one of the first step in the causal chain which is voting, which is also extremely important because it's the fiduciary duty of these funds. So let's talk about the voting uh, literature. We know that mutual funds have heterogeneous preferences about voting, but what is important is that voting matters. We know from uh, Erti Muradal and Fabrizio and Maver, I mean, Fabrizio Maver and others, that actually voting outcome and the influence of the proponent, and I'm gonna go back to this issue because I think it's important also empirically, they matter. They can bring, uh, they have consequences. We also know that mutual funds vary in how active they are and in how much they follow ISS recommendation. And given that this paper examines uh, index funds versus active funds, we also know that index funds, traditional funds, traditional index funds are less likely to vote against management on contentious governance issues. Uh, so basically, if you look at this graph, on the y-axis, you have the percentage of votes in favor of management. And on the x-axis, you have the fraction of uh, AUM that is into index funds. So you can see on the right side of the, of the chart, you can recognize the big three. So Vanguard, BlackRock, S3 Street, that basically are almost all index funds. And on the left-hand side, you will see Fidelity, T. Rowe Price, et cetera, that are mostly made by active funds. And so the more you move toward the right, the more you see that these funds tend to vote um, with management. But what is missing from this picture is the role of ESG funds and ES votings, which is exactly what the paper does. This is exactly what this, the paper of Mary and, uh, and, and their coders uh, and her coders uh, does. So if we think about what we know about the mutual fund voting literature and we think about ESG funds, this is the way I thought about the incentives of pay here. So these ESG funds are smaller, and, but they charge higher fees. And to my mind, if we look at Ilya Velauri, smaller funds tend to vote with ISS. ISS tend to support these ES issues, so we should expect more support by these funds. If they charge higher fee and point three, they're mostly active, they should do their own research, and therefore they should vote for these matters. But I think the, most, the last two points are the most important. The traditional funds do not have a clear stated objective as these funds. These funds have to invest in good firms, in green firms, or in good ESG firms, and make them better. And therefore, when it comes to voting on ES issues, they have a clear objective that they should follow. And on top of that, there is more SEC scrutiny, which also should lead toward uh, the findings of the paper. Now, to conclude the framework, the point is, is voting with, um, I mean, is voting against management, and of course, in favor of ES proposal enough to make an impact, and in particular, is it really an active choice or is more like a low cost action? 
to me, sounds more like a low cost action. When you're presented with an ES proposal and you are an ESG fund, I think the low cost thing to do is just to click the button and, and vote for that proposal. And this probably explains why the others find that index funds, passive index funds, are even more likely to support this proposal than active funds that probably can use other, uh, they can use their voice differently. So, and this takes me to my, the main point of, uh, of my uh, discussion, uh, which is what else can these funds do? So let's look at the complete picture of voting, okay? So the very first step is to submit a proposal. Then once you submit a proposal, you can engage with management, you can talk to managers, and then you can either keep the proposal if managers don't agree about, you know, with the proposal, or you can withdraw the proposal if the managers agree of making some choice, uh, some changes. Then you vote, which is what the paper does, but you also vote on other issues, which we learn from the literature could be complementary with the ES uh, voting. So my suggestion is to expand on this, and, and if I'm able to change the slides, to uh, expand on this and, uh, and look at the first step. The first step, if, I mean, is the submission of the proposal. If you don't submit a proposal, you're not in control of the agenda. You're just passively voting on something that somebody else has proposed. So for instance, the others can look at how many ESG funds file an ESG proposal. And what is the success rate of ESG proposals submitted by ESG funds relative to other proponents? For instance, if these funds are, in, if these proposals are implemented or not prior to the vote, if they are withdrawn, the others show that there are 3,000 withdrawn proposals in their sample. Let's examine these 3,000 withdrawn proposals and let's see if this relates with ESG funds. What is the voting outcome? And what is the implementation after the vote? And then I wanna stress on point three. Um, it's very important, the, the others are examining governance shareholder proposals, but the largest majority of governance proposals are management proposals. I'm thinking about director selection. And this is where all the issues are focused in the past, not only because they're the largest majority, but because they're important. And most of the times, if funds are unhappy, they're gonna vote against directors. And so maybe this is an opportunity for the others to see whether funds, ESG funds are unhappy, or maybe firms have low ESG scores, and that's when you can observe more opposition on uh, director selection. And the last point of my discussion is about voting complementaries. Again, in, with the idea of providing a broader picture of the, voting, uh, of the voting process. What came to mind is the typical, uh, you know, the, the case of engine number one versus Exxon, which everybody is familiar with. So the point is, does the presence of a fund, of an ESG fund, incentivize other funds to submit or to vote in favor of, a, of an ES proposal. And this is consistent with the strategic voting literature, Mats Bosso and Ostrowski, but it's also consistent with the portfolio selection in and of itself making an impact. And finally, the presence of ESG funds could increase the likelihood of adoption, so the exposed uh, engagement. So these to me are the two bigger things to provide a bigger and more complete picture of the, the total voting uh, process. All right, so to conclude, I really enjoyed the paper, uh, and I think we learned a lot. Uh, we didn't know about ESG voting, ESG funds voting. We didn't know about voting on ES. Now we do know. Uh, this is totally inconsistent with greenwashing, but it's consistent with fund objective and incentives. Now, if this is active, it's still unclear. I think the others can do more on that dimension, and and that's it. And that concludes my my discussion. I have a couple of slides with the, which I'll uh, share with the coders afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniele. Um, Mary, do you have any um, any 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 things you want to say in response to Daniele's um, present um, discussion? How about thank you? Sure. <laughs> it was a wonderful, and I've um, I the, I love the idea of um, looking at the submission because we came in in the middle. I think that's a really interesting point. That, um, I just yes. I think that those are really great points, and I really appreciate the thoroughness of the discussion. Great. So um, there's a lot of interesting questions, um, and I'll try my best to um, ask as many of them as possible here. Okay. Um, so um, generally, there's uh, a couple of questions that share um, Danielle's concern that um, voting in, um, in favor of the ESG um, proposal is cheap and it's easy to do. Um, so um, there's some suggestions to um, 
um, look at the impact, right? Does 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 vote does having um, a high percentage vote for ESG proposal actually make a difference to the firm? Um, and um, <clears throat> um, um, that Daniel from um, INSEAD um, asked, is it possible that um, to ad- identify proposals that are good for shareholders, um, that might not be good for shareholders, but are good for stakeholders, right? Um, is there any, any, um, any kind of votes that are easy for them to say yes to, but some votes that are, um, say, don't do business in a certain part of the world, that could be easy. So um, try and distinguish um, the type of proposal that might be good for certain stakeholders, but not stake. Um, and and um, how do they vote um, on the more costly shareholders proposal? Right. So um, when I think about, you know, it is hard to disentangle sort of the value, like the effect of the proposal, right, ex ante. But one, um, Poss- one possibility of looking at that is if you think that ISS, right, is recommending four because it's value increasing, right, that is a, a one uh, possibility. That's one potential way to think about. Um, so we've done some um, initial analysis on ISS, like for versus against, um, and, tr- and have tr- started to look at that. So that would be one way to get at uh, the question that was posed. Right. Okay. Um, so um, here's another question from Amir from uh, University of Oxford. Um, okay. So um, he's wondering whether um, part of the difference you document um, between the ESG and the non-ESG funds could be because the non-ESG funds are just more powerful in nature. So um, he's thinking about the... Um, the sequence of the shareholders proposal process, right? Um, So usually um, the proposal is the final stage of um, the whole process. Um, There's usually a background communication between the funds and the um, company itself. Um, So is it possible that um, the non-ESG funds are just more powerful in nature? So they already have their demand satisfied and then the ESG funds are less powerful and less able to get their demand satisfied. Therefore, um, um, that's why you observe the voting difference because the demand from the non, non-ESG non fund already was satisfied by um, back, background communication between the managers and the funds. That's an interesting point. And um, it, that would require us to go look at um, the submission process consistent with Daniele's uh, suggestion. Right, um, and maybe look at some of the fund flows right. um, for, for the non-ESG funds. Um, so um, here's another very interesting question from Lisa uh, at Columbia University. Um, so she's wondering, she, she thinks this is a very interesting paper um, and she find the difference between ES and G um, very, very interesting. Mm, okay. um, so she's wondering whether this is some kind, this might be driven by some kind of catch up hypothesis. So um, what she meant is that um, um, the ESG uh, proposal and the funds are monitored by many parties. So th- there's a huge incentive for them to implement them. Uh, whereas the G, the governance ha- uh, concept has been in place for a much longer period of time. So the governance aspect has very much largely, largely been implemented, whereas the E and S um, is sort of playing catch up now and, and you're documenting some sort of catch up effect as opposed to um, walk the talk. Yeah. So I, you know, it's interesting. I have found, I found the difference in the results interesting and compelling because I don't think people had showed that. Um, I'd have to think through, I don't have an answer off the top of my head right now about how you would be able to disentangle that empirically, uh, her suggestion. Um, but I'll have to I'll have to think about that more. Um, Maybe some kind of it, time but... analysis would help, like show that um, the the difference hasn't decreased over time if you have a long enough. If you... Yeah, and it, uh, the difference. Uh, okay, so looking, I understand what you're saying. Looking at the difference in the ES and the G over time. Over time, and yes. and show okay. that it hasn't decreased in the later years compared to the earlier yeah, years. That's, might, a, that's, a, that's a great idea. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, we've only looked, we've, we do know that the results um, within fund family hold over time. So, right. okay. I'll maybe highlight I'll, I'll that. Hold over, well, let me rephrase. Um, the results for the ES increase within fund family um, as time moves on. So, but we haven't looked at the sort of the differences. I'll have, we'll have to go back and look at that. Um, so this is um, a question from me and it's, it's in line with um, Danielle's um, um, major concern is, um, you know, how, how costly is this um, proposal, but from another point of view, right? Um, um, if you look at the proposal where uh, the funds actually if there's any cross-sectional difference within the ESG funds, right? If um, if they act, don't actually do what they're saying, if they are voting against the E and S proposal, is there any consequences on the fronts, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. Is there any fund outflows? And and for the for the bad guys, is there any punishment? And then for the good guys who constantly do a good job, following through with what they say they will do, um, is there more inflows, right? Um, right. To to beef up that con um, consequence. Um, uh, I guess real effects of your paper. Yeah, right. Because yeah. you're you're looking for the cost, like we've stated. There's a cost, a reputational cost. Right, right, right. 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 And you're trying to get some measure of what that cost might be. Right, right. right. Just some evidence out. that. Yeah. Right. I, yeah, I can completely say that. It's a good point. And we and we have not done that, so <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> so this is um. A question from uh, Patty, um, from USC, obviously. Um, do mutual funds use consultants to know how to vote on proposal? And could the consultants be the ones that are driving the results? Okay, so I guess I would ask when they say consultants, does she mean someone other than ISS? Just making sure. Uh, Patty, do you want to? jump in um, oh yes I just I, I mean I've just I know people who work in the consulting world who um, advise uh, clients on how to vote uh, on various proposals so I just wonder I don't know whether you have information on consulting we, yeah we do not um, is it impossible? So it's probably right. impossible to get to right, right. if the consultants uh, had a different had a different um, recommendation than ISS, I mean, we are controlling for ISS. So the ESG funds have got to be, it's got to be incremental to the ISS recommendations, which could come through their consultants, but we have no way to disentangle that. So um, that's all the questions um, okay. I've gathered. So um, thank you very much for the really interesting paper. Okay. And, Do I get um, bonus points for, for finishing early? <laughs> <laughs> of course <laughs> and thank you Danielle for um your excellent discussion um so yeah, now we have a so break much. thank you oh, we thank have you a guys half an, hour, half an hour break until um 11 15 um so you, you guys can go and hang out at remo um, <laughs>